So the first version of this talk was given at uh, BuzzFeed headquarters, so I have an alternate title slide. Um, so a, f a few disclaimers first. Um, so, you know, I try to touch on a lot of things during this talk, but it's by no means comprehensive. There's literally, you know, a hundred different ways you can add performance to your website. So I tried to focus on some of the main ones and some of the main areas. Um, and so if I'm missing something, you know, don't take, hold it against me. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so performance. Um, I, I think first it's useful to separate it out into two different kinds of performance and two different ways to deal with uh, performance on your site. Um, front end and back end, and, and they're very, very different in how you deal with them and, and, and uh, the implications thereof. Um, and they require like, significantly different approaches. Um, so I guess first, um, let's talk about front end performance. Um, when I hear people talk about performance a lot, they talk a lot about like, oh, I shaved 50 milliseconds off my, you know, endpoint or my my view or whatever. Um, and really, uh, if you're doing website performance, and you really should be starting with front end performance because um, 80 to 90 percent of the user response time on a typical web application will be on the front end, not on the back end. Um, so saving 50 milliseconds on your view is not going to make a difference. Saving one second on um, optimizing your JavaScript loading procedures is going to make a difference. Um, so Steve Souders, um, he's uh, worked at Yahoo and Google at, at basically as a performance evangelist, and he's written great books about um, performance applications for O'Reilly that uh, I would highly recommend. But um, let's start with the front end. Um, so front end work. So um, the attributes of front end performance work, um, they can be based, generally universally applied. So what, what does that mean? It means that when you make a fix or improve something, it's going to affect almost every view or every, every page of your site. Um, they often require systems and tooling changes. So it's not something, um, it, it's, a lot of it is like dealing with, oh, I need to override collect static to do something. I need to compile something and put it in a certain place so that it works. Um, so there's a lot of systems tooling. If you guys have op teams um, for bigger companies, a lot of times your ops people have to get involved with some of this stuff. Um, and uh, another attribute is it, they're often clear system independent best practices. So this is not often the case with uh, back end performance work. Um, a lot of front end performance work, there is a best way to do it. There is the known best way to do it. Um, so um, I guess I, we're gonna, I'm going to start with going through a few best practices and then talking about how you would do it um, in front end performance. Um, so the first one is caching static assets forever. So um, why would you want to do this? You'd want to do this because you serve your site up, you know, you're doing 10, 15, 20 requests a second. Um, your JavaScript or CSS, your images aren't really changing. Um, so you don't want the browser to constantly uh, be re-getting those resources every time someone refreshes the page or a new user, you know, they go to a different page that has the same JavaScript. So the ideal way to do this is to cache this uh, um, asset, CSS file, JavaScript file, image file, forever, and only change it when um, the image itself or CSS or JavaScript changes. Um, it's called, basically, it's called fa far futures caching is what a lot of people call this. Um, so how do you do this? Um, how you do this, well, before it used to be fairly difficult. Um, now, uh, you know, ever since several versions ago, Django has the static, static files uh, as a standard part of Django. All you really have to do is, um, set your static file storage to be cache static file storage, or if you have your own storage, use the cache files mix-in. Um, suddenly, if you look at, um, you open up like Firebug or Web Developer Tools and you, and you see what, what happened to your images or your CSS, you'll, you'll notice that they're renamed, like cat.jpg became cat.123.jpg, and that's um, something that basically Django does for you, and it changes the name of the file every time the asset changes. Therefore, things are cached as long as humanly possible. Um, so the second best practice, bundle, bundle, minify, compress static assets. So uh, first of all, what does this mean? So bundling means you have 11 JavaScript files on a page. You, you, take, you, take, you reduce that to one or two. Um, minifying means you take all extra white space and long, long variable names, anything you can out of that JavaScript file. Um, compressing simply means to basically gzipping it. So this is like, the, typically this is done in, by one packet. So in Rails, this comes like standard. Um, in, in Django, um, you need a, basically a static asset manager to do this. Um, the reason you'd want to do this is um, reducing the number of requests is a strict benefit um, 
for making your applications fast. If, if you ever look at um, how applications are loaded, like if you, if you fire up um, Firebug and you look at the network panel and you look at how they're lo loading, you'll notice there's this like stair step pattern to how um, assets are loaded. It'll load like eight at a time, it'll stop, it'll wait for one of those eight to finish, and it'll get another one. And, and that's because um, browsers basically have a limit per domain of how many simultaneous requests they'll allow on that domain. Um, this is a little bit better in the mo more modern browsers, but if you ever have to deal with IE8 or, or God forbid, IE7, um, they have you know, four, four uh, assets, four connections to a particular domain at one time. So you'll notice if you have 14 JavaScript files, it'll be loading four, it'll stop, it won't do anything until one of those is finished downloading, it'll get another one, it'll get another one, it'll get another one. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the number of requests as low as possible. Um, and static asset managers do that. Um, so uh, to, to, use, to do this kind of management, basically you've got to use an um, a external package. Two really good ones, um, Django Pipeline, actively developed. Uh, the guy, you know, he uh, takes a lot of pull requests and is always uh, adding stuff. Um, and from the Flask world, Web Assets, which also has a uh, Django Web Assets uh, extension to it, also great at this stuff. Um, uh, so bonus points. The other, other thing, uh, definitely Pipeline, I'm not sure about Web Assets support, is um, in your CSS files, if you're referencing images and those images are under 32K, it'll take those images, it'll turn them into base64, and it'll embed it right in the CSS file. So um, I don't know how many of you guys, uh, like, maybe like seven, eight, nine years ago, the best practice for um, reducing number of requests for like uh, websites that might have like 50 little icons was, was having your designer create sprites and then using those sprites and doing these like CSS offsets to get to the next image and the next image and the next image. Um, so with data URIs, you don't really need to do that. You can, you can have 50 images, each with a little icon. You can reference them in your, in your CSS file. And um, the, the, uh, the st static asset manager will find that, replace it with a base64 equivalent, and you won't have to deal with, uh, dealing with managing sprites. Um, OK, another best practice, um, st serving static files via CDN. So CDN um, is going to provide less, less latency to your user. Um, if any like uh, bigger shops like you guys do performance monitoring or testing, and a lot of the performance monitoring tools will show you like the results as if your site was loaded in Brazil and as if it was loaded in Russia and as if it, you know because they'll they'll keep servers in those areas and they'll tell you what the latency is. So you won't really notice it maybe locally because you're in New York and your servers are in Virginia. Um, but in Brazil, they might be getting a completely uh, different experience of your website. Um, so that's why it, it pays to use a CDN. Um, so using CDNs in Django is uh, fairly simple. I mean, there's a, a, a bunch of ways to do it. Um, one good way we like, um, use an extension called Django Storages, which provides custom storage uh, classes. Um, we, we happen to use the S3 one. We, put, we um, store all our uh, static assets in S3. We point our CDN to S3, and we're done. Um, OK, another uh, best practice. Um, so serving more stuff as static assets. So this is a kind of a general one, but I think it's, it's one that um, is really applicable. So a lot of, I, I think, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys now, you're using Angular, you're using Backbone, you're using Ember. Um, you're doing less of your templating in, uh, on the server side. You're doing a lot more of your templating on the client side. Um, so as, as a lot of these applications turn into like single page applications where the server side basically just returns JSON and the, um, the rest of the stuff happens on the client side, there's an opportunity to store more and more things as static assets. Um, as you store them as static assets, they take load off your servers, you can use the CDN, um, you can cache them forever, there's all these advantages. Um, so front end templates, like your Angular templates, your Ember templates are perfect candidates for, using a static, for serving as static assets. What that requires is a little bit of tooling. I mean, it depends on exactly what JavaScript framework you're using and how your stuff is set up. Um, but it can definitely be done. We do it with Angular, and it, it works brilliantly. Um, other thing you can look at is, uh, are there things that, are there pieces of data that only change in between releases? Like, us personally, we have all these like, fairly complex menus. They're really just like, big pieces of JSON. Um, we were serving them as, as, you know, as part of like, a payload and on the server side, and it was like, getting stuck on the page, and the page would, would load it um, via JavaScript. What we realized is we could actually just serve those as static assets, have Angular grab those static assets, and it added, it took off several hundred milliseconds from a, a lot of our um, 
key endpoints. Um, okay, so um, let's let's go to back end performance work. Um, well, you you notice uh, so it's front end performance work. It it it's a lot easier to go through because there are some global um, things you can just do, and you can say this is the right way to do it. You should do it this way. Back end performance is um, a lot more nuanced. Um, often it can be done on a only on a case to case basis. So every site is going to be different. The views are going to be different. Your approach to making things faster is going to be different. Um, a lot of times they require code changes. It's not, it's not just systems and tooling and using a different static file storage. Um, you're going to have to get in there, understand what that slow view is doing, and, and deal with it. Um, like I said, it's very site specific, situation specific. Um, so there's not a lot of global stuff. Um, but OK, there are some global stuff you can do. Just to do's you can check off your list. You can use cache sessions. Um, by default, or I think by default, Django has uh, DB sessions turned on. So every, every session makes a few hits to the DB. You can switch that to either a pure cache session or a cached DB session. Um, and it'll, it'll take a few, uh, a few hits off your database. You can use the cache template loader. So a couple, I don't know, four or five Django's ago, um, uh, the templates, basically every time you'd make a request, the template would get recompiled. They fixed that. Um, and the solution was to use the cache template loader, um, which is basically just a Django setting. You use it, you use it in production. It works. It's strictly faster. Um, uh, maybe it's slightly controversial, but I, I don't know if it is. Um, so if you're starting a brand new project, or you have an existing project that is making like heavyweight use of Django templates, you might consider switching to Jinja 2. Um, it's generally considered to be faster. Um, and you know, I, I would only do it on a new project or someone where it's really performance critical, because it is a pain if you're actually switching on, and then you have a fairly big site. Um, but you, would, you should see some performance benefits from switching to Jinja 2 or starting a project on Jinja 2 instead of using the, the standard Django um, uh, templating engine. OK, so now um, kind of the real stuff. So, uh, so how do you start um, performance optimizing on the back end? I mean, first, you should start with a disclaimer. Um, you don't want to do this on every view. You don't want to do it everywhere. You don't want to like go and say, oh, I'm just going to make my site faster. Um, there's a waste of time, because you'll be optimizing stuff that like five users a day touch. Um, and unlike, unlike front end performance, where it adds some complexity, but it's, it's like a hard limit to how much complexity it adds, um, back end performance, you can go crazy. You can take every view and op obfuscate it to, to get you know, 50 milliseconds out of it. So you really want to pick your spots and pick the key points that are performance sensitive that hundreds of users, thousands of users touch every single day and work on that. Because typically, performance um, optimization on the back end is going to add code complexity. Um, one programmer is going to do it, and the next programmer is going to come and not understand what, why this is being done. Uh, it, it's not often obvious. You're doing, a lot of times, you're doing non-obvious things that, that only make sense if you're looking at it from a performance perspective. So you really want to pick your battles. Um, but Let's say you did find a problem view, a view that was slow, that, that was critical to your application. How do you start? Um, you don't want to just start like randomly, like, oh, this you know, SQL query looks slow. Let me go optimize it. Oh, why are we using this data structure? Let me go fix it. Um, if you do that, you're basically flying blind. So what you really want to do, anytime you do back-end performance work, you start with a profile. Um, a profile basically tells you um, how long is this view taking to return? What are the elements of it? Um, you know, what are the pieces that you should be focusing on? Um, there's, if you just Google uh, Django, Python, Profiler, Middleware, you'll see like 50 of them. Um, there's various good ones. I, I linked to one that we like. Um, I'm sure there's some that are just as good, if not better. Um, so what does a profile look like? You're not really supposed to be able to read everything there, but that's what a profile looks like. How it typically works is, is um, you install your profile middleware, and you give it a... Um, a custom like uh, get param. You say and profile equals one. And when the profile middleware sees that, instead of returning your normal view, your normal JSON, it returns something that looks like that. So what you see is typically you'll see the functions that are called, how many times they are called, um, how how much time each call takes, um, how much time the total calls take. Um, this profile profile middleware specifically, it also gives you modules and how much how much time is spent in each particular module. So this gives you a map of okay. I have this view that's slow. What part of it is slow? Is it my function? Is it Django? Is it SQL? Is it just Python I'm doing? Is it this library that I didn't know about that I'm using? 
where, where do I look first? Um, so looking at that, typically what you'll see is you'll see like, like let's say that's a SQL problem. You'll see 90, 95% of the time sp spent in Django slash DB slash like mysql.py. Um, so that gives you a good indication. Okay, it's a SQL problem. Um, if it's not a SQL problem, you'll see a lot of like various Python functions that are taking up a lot of time. Um, so let's, so yeah, things to look for. Um, tons of time spent in SQL. It's one place you can really pretty, pretty easily improve. Um, functions that are recalled called way too many times. You'll see basically every time we've done a profile on a, like a performance sensitive thing that seems like it's running slower than it should, um, we've often been em embarrassed, almost ashamed at like what we've seen. Like, oh my god, why is this function getting called 10,000 times? It, you know, it, it should be getting called 50 times. There must be something wrong. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you look for, things you don't expect. And it's very site specific. You, know, you really have to know your application well to know what looks odd to you and what, look, what looks normal. Um, but that, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Either SQL or like, oh, this function is being called way too many times, or it's taking way longer than I would have expected given what I know it's doing. Um, so, so let's start with SQL. What if, what if the problem is SQL? You look at your profile, 90% of it's in SQL. So what do you do? Um, you start with, there's great tools out there to help you uh, uh, kind of diagnose and solve those problems. Django Debug Toolbar, which I'm sure almost everyone here knows, um, is, is, is a great tool. You install it. You, you turn on the, the SQL-specific plugin. Every, every front-end view you see, you'll get a sidebar. You open the sidebar. You'll see every SQL query. You'll see how much time each SQL query takes. Um, so that's very helpful to begin with. If, uh, where that kind of falls down is if you have um, uh, back-end-only views, basically things that return JSON. So Django uh, Debug Toolbar won't really attach themselves to that because it actually looks for like an HTML to attach to. Um, so in that case, there's another uh, tool called Django Dev Server, which um, basically replaces the standard Django server. And um, you can turn on different modules. And the different modules, one of, one of the modules basically as the view is, uh, uh, as the server is doing work, it'll output every SQL uh, query it's doing. And it'll output um, how long each query it's taking. It'll also, it'll also like mark when the same uh, query is being done 50 times. It'll say like 50 duplicates. Um, so, so on the back end, that's a really, uh, um, good place to start. So typically SQL problems, they, they fall into two, one of two big categories. One, the SQL query you're doing is taking too long. Um, two, you're doing too many SQL queries. Um, so you know, e each of those have um, different uh, ways to solve. Um, so there's basically, if you, if you look at every Django release, it seems like every Django release, they, re they um, release another way to get around a, a, a SQL issue. So um, I think since the days of 1.0, select related has been around. And then each release, been, they've been adding different ways to like, get your SQL to, to do what you want it to do. So I'm going to go through a few of them. Um, this list is by no means uh, comprehensive, but it'll, it'll touch a lot of the major things that we've seen that can, can help with SQL. Um, so select related. Select related, um, it solves a really common problem in Django. You have a foreign key. You have um, a car, and, and you have passengers. And passengers refer to the car they're in. Um, and you're iterating through passengers, and you try to like, print out the car they were in. And each query of a passenger will also do a query to get the car. So you'll see like, if you're printing 100, 100 passengers, you're making 100 queries to get the car. So you, something you might expect takes five. You know, here's this view. It should be five queries long. You know, it's doing 105 queries. Um, actually, if you go to the Django admin, Django admin is, is really bad at this. Um, if you, if you, um, if you uh, ever open up Django Debug Toolbar to a Django admin where you reference an, another model inside the list view, you'll see 100 queries. Um, if you're ever wondering why your Django admin is slow, that's, that's usually the reason. Um, so the way to solve this, um, select related. Um, select related, basically, you, you, you basically tell Django why they're getting the passenger, also do a join internally in SQL, and get the car so we don't have to get it 100 times each, each time we're iterating. Um, so values, values, list. So a lot of times. Um, the Python object, the model that Django returns to you um, when you do a ORM query is, is just uh, kind of getting in the way of you just getting the data. What you eventually really do is just turn it into a dict and return it as JSON anyway. Um, so it turns out there's like a lot of overhead with, with creating this Django object that is your car or is your passenger. Um, it does a lot of stuff to make that happen. Um, you can basically, if you know that you know, you're not doing anything with the object, you're not calling any methods, all you're really going to do is you're going to just take that and put into Python dict anyway and return it. Um, values, values, lists are two ways to do that. Um, they basically return a list, or they return a dict with, with the fields you wanted. Um, and you, you can basically uh, bypass a lot of that Python overhead. 
Um, DB index equals true. I mean, it's like you know a 40-year-old. You know, ever since relational databases have existed, there's been indices basically, and a lot of times um, you're you're querying by a particular thing that doesn't that doesn't have an index on it, and it ends up being a lot slower than you would expect. So DB index is one way around that. Um, so an another page of SQL tricks you can use. Um, so prefetch related. Um, prefetch related solves a very particular problem. So um, select related that I mentioned previously, it doesn't work. In particular, it doesn't work with many-to-many -many, uh, relationships. Um, it, it's, it's because internally, select related is done with a, with a SQL join, and it doesn't really map well to making that happen in one SQL query um, by using joins. So what prefetch related does, it does the, basically the same thing. It, um, it allows you to, like, you know, let's say in our case, a passenger could have been in multiple cars. So, so there's a many-to-many -many relationship. It makes that um, work without doing 100 queries. And it, instead of doing the kind of the matching and, and avoiding 100 queries um, in SQL, what it does is it actually does it in Django, in, in, in Python, really. Um, it, it, it gets the two tables you want. It does the matching for you. And it, it allows you to um, avoid a lot of extra queries. Um, Prefetch related, even if um, you don't use it in many to many queries, that they, it does have certain advantages. Like we've seen, um, if you're doing select related on four or five different tables, internally in SQL, that's like a five-way join, which is like uh, typically a really bad, big no-no. Um, so sometimes prefetch related um, is, is faster because Python basically does a better job than, than SQL would. Um, only. So only is, um, so if you, if you open up Django Debug Toolbar and you do your typical ORM stuff, you'll see that um, every time Django gets a model or, or, or a, a you know, series of models, it's actually getting every single field from, from SQL. Um, it's not really a problem un until it is, right? So you, you, have, you have five or six fields on a you know, 100 row table. It, you'll never really see it as a problem. You have 10,000 rows, and each of those rows have 80 columns. Um, and you happen to only need four columns in this view. You're just returning the name and the URL, let's say. And there's 76 other columns. Then it becomes a big problem. Um, so only solves this problem. Basically, what only does is it says, uh, Instead of getting all these 80 columns out of this table, get the four that I know I need. And I'll just work with those. Um, it kind of happens with a little bit of magic. So if you happen to um, access a field that um, wasn't in your only, um, it'll, it'll actually query and get the field so it won't fail. Um, and this could be a good thing in the sense that your stuff won't break. Um, why I have this use, use this caution, it can also be a really bad thing. So if you're using only and you're getting these five fields you need, Another program comes along and says, oh, I need this sixth field. And they, they access it without, without ever, ever thinking about it. Um, we've had situations where suddenly this, this, this view is you know, 3x lower. And oh, wait, what happened? Oh, something that was like five queries has turned into 500. Because now each, of, each and every one of those iterations is going and getting the object again, because it's missing a field that wasn't in the only. So you, you want to be sure when you use only that you are very, very careful with it. Um, you, you know, use it with caution, comment it well. You know, just be careful. It's useful, but it, you know, it, it can also be dangerous. Um, defer is kind of the, in, in some ways, the opposite of only. Rather than saying, hey, these are the fields I want, you're saying, these are the fields I don't want. Um, similar, similar thing, it's a performance thing. It, you, know, I, I, you know, one common good thing you can do is, you know, you have 80 fields, and, and you don't want to get too specific about, about exactly the fields you want, but you have these 10 big text fields that you know you don't want you know you're never going to need in the context of this view. Um, you use defer, you take those out, and you, you, save, you save that time that it takes to get that uh, data. So bulk, bulk create, so there's like now bulk functions, bulk updates, and bulk creates in, 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 um, in Django. So a lot, you know, most of your performance problems maybe are, are you know, read-based, but um, you know, we're a, like a financial data company. We insert a lot of data. We get it in, in big blocks. And bulk create has been great for uh, uh, basically speeding up the, the um, inserts. Um, so what if all, you know? You, those are some tools. I think there's some other ones too. But if none of that works, um, you can always fall back on raw. Django basically gives you access into, hey, I need to do this raw query um, and just get out of my way. So you know, raw is kind of a last last resort thing you can do, but it, it can be helpful sometimes. Um, so uh, denormalization. I mean, that's a classic. It has nothing to do with Python and Django. It's a classic. Um, way to deal with uh, uh, performance problems as they relate to SQL. 
you know, a typical case, you have a blog, and the blog has comments, and you want to print the number of comments. So that can be really slow if you have to do if you have to do the query every time. So instead, every time a new comment is written, you update this thing called num comments, um, which ke keeps a running count of the comments of the blog. So it's it's a very typical um, uh, old performance trick, but it's one that's still I think very widely useful. Um, and I just want to throw it out there, but it, it is you know it is something to consider um, if you're doing SQL. Do you really need to be doing SQL? Um, Oftentimes, yes. Uh, sometimes, no. I'm just using the SQL as a, basically a key value store. Um, I'm just using the SQL to search on. Um, well, you know, it turns out a lot of these, a lot of these you know, specific domains um, are these days handled a lot better by alternate uh, databases like Redis for your sets and lists and sorting, you know, um, uh, memcache for key value storing, you know, you know, whatever the case may be. But it's something to consider um, when SQL is, uh, seems to be failing you. Um, so the other side of um, uh, performance optimization on the back end, it's, it's Python. So um, you, know, the, you, know, you look at your profile, and SQL is 5 or 10% of the total, total runtime. So it's not a SQL issue, really. But you're seeing this Python stuff happen. Um, so you know, uh, what do you look for? How do you, how do you deal with it? Um, so you know, classic computer science, you look for bad algorithms first, right? You look for some things that are you know, n squared that don't need to be. Um, you know, people will, you know, we've seen, our, we have had programmers in my company, you do something, you don't even think about it when it's, you know, there's 10 objects in the, in the database. You know, a year later, there's 100,000 objects, and this bad algorithm you, you did suddenly shows itself as, oh, wow, that's n squared, and that's a big problem. Um, so bad, bad algorithms is something you, you look for. Um, you know, uh, doing extra work in loops, I, you know, I've seen that a lot, like people, People checking things inside the loop that don't ever change because of anything that happens in the loop. Like it's something we've, I've seen a lot. Um, it, you know, things. You know, the other one, like, you know, you have this function. It's like you don't you don't ever perceive it as slow. Um, it does what it does efficiently. It, it returns you know the result you're expecting, but it's just slow enough that if you run run it ten thousand times inside a loop, suddenly it's a big problem. Um, so really, basically. It, per performance on the Python or non-SQL side, I sum it as, uh, up as uh, people doing bad stuff inside loops. Like almost nothing is a problem until you do it a thousand or ten thousand times. Then it's a big problem. Um, so that's what you look for. You look for your, your, your slow function, or and then you try to find that place where oh wow, like why are we doing this or why does this take you know a, a hundredth of a second except we do it a thousand times. Um, so fixing this stuff. Um, so I want to give a warning. Like sometimes you just you have to get weird. Like sometimes this stuff like doesn't make sense. Like what you're doing, no sane person would do it until you have this performance problem and you need to solve it. Um, and I wanted to give two examples of of um, things that we've seen in our code. Um, so this is one we saw. So we saw decimal point one. Um, it was used as a constant in a function, um, and Turns out decimal point one isn't like a normal constant, right? It's a it's a function, it's an object creation, really. And you know, at least until Python three, uh, three, three, um, you know, the decimal is implemented purely in Python, so it's kind of slow. Um, so we had a function that had decimal point one, and it was using it as a rounding exponent. It's like something pretty common if you if you guys are familiar with the the decimal um, module. Um, it wasn't a problem until we had this thing that was returning 10,000 rows of data. Um, it, was, it was rounding each one, so it was being run 10,000 or 20,000 times. And suddenly, this thing was taking a quarter of a second. Um, this constant, like this thing that was doing nothing, right? Um, so, so, so the solution for us was to make a re really dumb constant at the top of our file called decimal point one that was evaluated at decimal point one and use it. Um, it worked. It immediately, suddenly, your, your profile, like, oh, there goes a quarter of a second off your profile. Um, so this exact problem, and I guess we're going we're gonna to do a pull request pretty soon. So we do a lot of stuff with decimal. This exact problem is in actually the core Django code. If you look at how a decimal thing gets saved, one of the things it does is it uses constant decimal point one for its rounding. This exact thing, and it was it's just recently showed up in our profiles when we've tried to save like 10,000 rows using bulk create with decimal. So it's something you just never think about until you you know you do your profile and you're like, oh, what, what's this? Um, so example number two, like um, reverse. So reverse is great. Like you know, don't repeat yourself. Just you know, 
reference the URL by name, give it, give it its arguments, it'll, it'll return the, the, the real URL. Um, reverse, reverse is kind of slow. Um, you know, it's fine if you do it once or twice, but we had a, we had a situation where we were returning an Excel table with, with like 5,000 rows. It had the symbol and it had the URL you could get to the symbol. It's just an output we needed. So we were running reverse 50,000 times. So on, on the exact, mind you, the exact same uh, URL endpoint, not different ones, just the exact same one. So it looked exactly like this. Um, and, and doing it with real data, it was taking a lot, lot, lot longer. So instead of what we did is we ran it once with a placeholder argument, and then we used string replace to replace that placeholder argument with the real data. Kind of crazy, you would never want to do it, except when you're trying to make something fast and you need to do it, right? Um, so that's kind of two like weird points. And I guess I show these weird points not necessarily to say that you're going to have these same problems. Well, if you work with decimal, you will probably actually have this exact same problem. But really to show that it's, it's, it's very uh, application specific. And sometimes you're just going to have to do strange things to get things to go fast. Um, it's not obvious. And it's not something worth even doing until you know that something is a problem. Because um, no sane person would do this kind of stuff, right? You wouldn't do it as just like standard from day one, you write this kind of code because you think it's the right thing to do. Um, we do this thing like in very, very choice places that we know we have to do it because otherwise it's like, it sounds, it's like ridiculous. Um, so what if um, you done, you've done all that stuff, your, your, your Python is as fast as it can be, you've done all the weird stuff, um, your SQL is as optimal as you can be, um, and you're still, it's not fast enough. Um, so what's the, the classic, solution to uh, performance problems when you've done everything else. Um, so cache, right? So cache and then cache some more. Anything you can cache, cache it. Um, so that, you know, caching is tricky. Well, there's a saying that says caching is easy and validation is hard. Um, so um, yeah, you can cache anything, but obviously users are expecting a, have a certain expectation of how up to date your data is going to be. So for you, the challenge is, OK, um, let me isolate um, this thing that I want to cache that I know is slow. Let me think about how often this thing needs to be, you know, changes, or how often it needs to be up to date. Is it something that someone won't care about, um, even if it's, you know, if the exact number is six hours old, or is it something that's so important that, you know, it needs to be, you know, within a minute, um, up to date? So once you've um, isolated these things, then then you you cache them. So how do you cache them? Um, so to start with, Django Django provides some tools. Um, there's a view cache, which, which is a Python decorator. You can put on any view, and it'll, uh, it'll um, read the arguments of the view, and it'll cache as a, as a key based on those arguments in that particular view. Uh, it can be helpful. Um, there's a template fragment cache. So you can, it's, it's basically a, a, just a, like a template function. You put it around any, any um, piece of uh, you know, templating, and basically anything that happens inside of that is cached. So remember that in Django, um, queries are lazy, so if the query a lot of times won't be um, evaluated until the template is like looping over the thing that the query returns. So it's going to cache all that stuff. Um, so that can be useful. Um, but we've we've personally found a lot of the like more useful levels of caching aren't don't come necessarily standard with Django. Um, for us, some of the most useful things is, has been isolating a function, whether it be a function. A, uh, a method inside an instance method inside a class or a class method inside a class and saying hey I want to cache this um, so we have interfaces into stocks and the stocks have you know data series they return so a really convenient thing for us to do is have the stock it has a class method or an instance method and it returns this data based on arguments and it's a very convenient place for us to say hey cache this for an hour um, so for that you need to basically a function level cache um, something that'll look at that wrap around any function and cache um, so a really popular caching uh, package is called Django Cache Utils, which does um, function level caching and it does a lot of other stuff. Um, uh, we, we actually wrote one called Django Cache Helper, which only does function type caching and nothing else, because we, we didn't want to deal with like, other things the package did. We just wanted this 100 lines of code that can cache a package. So if you, if you Google Django Cache Helper, um, there's very short documentation. and You can just use it. Um, and you basically put a decorator around any method, instance method, class method, whatever. And based on the name of that method, the, where it is, like what module it's in, and the arguments, it'll create a key, and it'll cache it for how, however long you, you tell it to. Um, so, and then lastly, um, there's a qu query caching. So query caching is something I think, at least I noticed, get popular in Django maybe 
three or so, three or four years ago, where there's all of these packages released um, that were trying to, to solve the query caching problem. And basically, how they worked is they they attached um, either automatically or, or either implicitly or explicitly. Um, you would tell you would you would tell particular ORM calls to say um, to cache for a certain amount of time. Um, so two of these were one was called Django Cache Machine, and it, I think it originated out of Mozilla. Um, Django Cache Ops, I think it was just a, kind of a guy, like a consultant. Um, and they tried to solve kind of two different things. One was just caching queries. Um, the second one uh, they tried to solve was automatic invalidation. Um, so knowing um, when this query should be out of date, and then, so, and then um, clearing the cache uh, when they know it was going to be out of date. Um, so I mean, this is a, kind of a, a big topic, but uh, I wanted to put it out there. So th these things do exist, and they are used. Uh, I think Mozilla still uses Django Cache machi Machine, although I could be wrong. Um, but you know, they're complex, and there's a lot of caveats. So you know, invalidation is hard, and knowing when to automatically invalidate a query is hard. Um, you can still use these tools to like explicitly invalidate, but, but implicitly, um, there's, it comes with certain caveats, but it can be uh, kind of extremely useful. Um, and I think, yeah, a few minutes early, but that's, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? <laughs>